Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Ways and Means Committee. Welcome to uh, Gordon Medenica and his team from the uh, Lottery and Gaming Commission. Uh, today, we're having a briefing uh, to get updates on, on this past year. We have Mr. Gordon Medenica and his team. He can introduce them. Uh, they will have a presentation. I'm not sure if they are uh, have a PowerPoint for us. They always have the best materials for us at regular briefings. Um, and uh, just want to thank everyone for joining us. And uh, uh, Mr. Medenica, maybe if there's sections to the report that we can then take questions per section so we can keep it in the same area. Uh, so we'll have that prepared. And uh, thank you for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Madam Chair and uh, members of the committee. And uh, I don't know if uh, Delegate Buckle is on the, uh, the call today, but uh, Powerball was won uh, in Allegheny County last night, $730 million in a very small town. Uh, and uh, you know, the retailer uh, also gets $100,000. And quick back of the envelope calculation is the state tax on, uh, if he chooses to take the, uh, the cash, which most winners do, uh, the state tax revenue will be almost $50 million. So that's a, certainly a nice little gift for us this morning. Uh, it's nice to have a big win. This is the all-time biggest jackpot win in Maryland. The last time we shared in the jackpot was 2012, uh, I, where there was a three-way uh, win with uh, two other states. Uh, and uh, so we're, uh, we're really, really pleased. And it's been an incredibly hectic time. And by the way, Mega Millions continues to roll. And uh, uh, even though the advertised uh, jackpot is 970 million, given that Powerball has now been won, we fully expect Mega Millions to probably be over a billion dollars. So that's drawing uh, comes up tomorrow night. So hopefully uh, all of you, uh, maybe the state itself should buy some tickets, <laughs> certainly would help on some fiscal issues. <laughs> Um, I think we're all imagining how that $50 million could be the funding source for our special programs. I suspect it's already been spent. So, <laughs> Nevertheless, um, I know that uh, we do have a, a, a fairly uh, uh, big PowerPoint deck, and I believe, Sarah, you were going to uh, be able to do the screen share and put the deck up on the screen. So uh, I'll wait for a second, and hopefully you can get that up. Excellent. Bailey, sorry. Uh, Okay, um, and with me today is uh, Jim Nielsen, who is our uh, Deputy Director and COO. Uh, James Butler is our Managing Director for Organizational Compliance, and Carol Gentry is our Managing Director for Communications. So next slide, please. Uh, this is just the uh, sort of the table of contents and the outline and perhaps where we'll, we'll take some break points uh, as we go through this. First of all, we'll uh, talk about traditional lottery, how we did in fiscal year 2020, uh, how things look for the, uh, the current fiscal year and uh, some comments about our uh, portfolio. Then we'll talk about the casinos, obviously a very different story there, but we'll mention how we did last year, even through the pandemic and the shutdown. Uh, then very briefly, we'll just touch on some of the ancillary responsibilities that uh, our agency has. And finally, I suspect uh, probably what uh, will be most interesting for many of you, uh, some additional information on our competitive situation with surrounding states, and obviously uh, a topic on everybody's uh, top of mind these days, sports betting. So next slide. Um, you've all seen this before. This is our fiscal year 20 uh, traditional lottery results. We nearly set an all-time record, uh, which was amazing because if you go back two years, it was when we had that one point, uh, nearly $6 billion Mega Millions jackpot, and we thought it would be years before we would ever top that. But uh, last year, uh, even with the, uh, the pandemic, uh, we did uh, extremely well. Uh, as you can see here, almost $2.2 billion in sales, uh, almost $590 million in profit. And as you can see, the, uh, the bulk of the revenue obviously goes right back to the players and prizes. Uh, and uh, one, one of the things that we're constantly proud of is our very low operating expenses there at 3.4%. Uh, and of course, retailers do very well with us as well. Almost 164 million that went to our uh, about 4,400 retailers, uh, many of them small businessmen around the state. So let me just take a quick uh, run through, next slide please. Uh, the various games, 
Uh, the lottery really is a, a fairly large organization in terms of the products that we offer uh, to our customers. Uh, we categorize our games uh, in, in some groupings, uh, draw games, monitor games, jackpot games. Uh, the daily draw games have been doing extremely well. In fact, that represents more than a quarter of our business. Pick three, pick four, these other games listed. Monitor games, uh, again, very strong category for us. And where we are almost unique in the lottery industry in the U.S. is that we have two monitor games, Kino and Racetracks. Kino, the traditional one, has generally been larger, but certainly in the last few months, Racetracks has been doing extremely well. And I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, if not this fiscal year, next fiscal year, the jackpot, that Racetracks becomes even a larger game than Kino. And then, of course, the jackpot games, everybody's familiar with Mega Millions, Powerball, uh, or multi-match, things like that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then sort of the fourth category, the way we think of it, are instant games. And of course, traditionally, we have the scratch-off games. We launch probably 50 of those uh, a year. Uh, we have a, a monthly launch cycle uh, where three, four, five uh, games, uh, new games are put in the market. And then as they uh, uh, become stale over time, they are withdrawn and we're constantly renewing and uh, putting new games uh, into the market. Uh, next slide. There's a new category of game for us called Fast Play, and it sort of combines aspects of instant tickets with draw games. Uh, the way you play Fast Play is to actually uh, request a ticket to come out of the terminal, much like our daily draw games. Uh, however, the, uh, whether or not you win or not is, is pretty immediately obvious as soon as you get that ticket. So you can buy one of these and much like a scratch off without having to scratch, uh, you know immediately whether or not you've won. Uh, the launch of Fast Play was uh, probably one of the, uh, the best in the country. Uh, unfortunately, we launched just before the, uh, the pandemic hit. And so we had a bit of a, a soft spot and then came back in June and launched our next, next batch of games and uh, continued to do well. They also, several of the games have a progressive feature that's proven to be very popular with our players as well. Next slide. Uh, this gives you a, a sense of magnitude uh, again, what's, what's interesting here is everybody knows Powerball and Mega Millions, obviously, but in fact, they represent, uh, you know, only about 10% of our portfolio. So uh, we need to, you know, be careful that we understand really where, uh, we're, where uh, our business is. As you can see, the daily draw games, as I mentioned, pick three, pick four, uh, huge contributors uh, to our overall performance. Uh, and certainly the, uh, the instant games, primarily the scratch offs, but fast uh, play coming up quickly. Monitor games, again, a very large and important category for us. And then we have a number of smaller games that have unique customers and uh, continue to do well and make money for us, even though they're not uh, you know, hugely significant in terms of our total portfolio. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I think several of you have seen uh, this slide before, but I think it's worth repeating because uh, we went through a period of uh, uh, great uh, concern when the uh, pandemic first hit. And of course, uh, about 15% of our retail base was shut down immediately, uh, bars and restaurants, things like that. And for a few weeks in a row there, we saw sales going down 20, 25, 30%. And frankly, we did not know where the bottom was. Uh, we didn't know if we were going to have, this was going to be the new normal for the lottery. But then uh, by around uh, May and June, uh, we saw sales rebounding very strongly. And as you can see from the chart, uh, actually generating 20% over year over year gains. And it was that, uh, that tail from uh, May and June that really allowed us to uh, come at the end of the year so close to setting an all-time record. So an interesting dynamic. And I have to say that has continued. Uh, our sales have uh, uh, been very strong in all categories, uh, particularly instance draw games and monitor games. The national jackpot games, interesting enough, given where we are today, the national jackpot games have been soft for a, for a while. And so, but with these current two jackpots that uh, are, are rolling at the, at the moment, uh, even that category now is very strong. So I, I fully expect that uh, our year on the traditional lottery side will, will be excellent. Um, 
And, and to demonstrate that, next slide, please. Uh, here you can see how uh, in fiscal year 20, we almost uh, exceeded our fiscal year 19 all-time record. Uh, again, that had that billion and a half mega millions jackpot. Uh, and now, as you can see, the, uh, uh, the estimates from the Bureau of Revenue Estimates uh, have uh, substantial increases, both on sales and profit. And when these estimates were made, which was uh, just last month in December, frankly, we, uh, <clears throat> we, we, had, we had a moment there. We thought, wow, that, that's aggressive. Um, but uh, now with the, uh, the jackpots in the national uh, jackpot games, uh, we're feeling increasingly comfortable with these projections and uh, uh, with good luck and continued good fortune for the rest of the fiscal year, we, we certainly hope to, to make those numbers and produce an all time record year. Um, I'm gonna pause for a moment uh, per Madam Chair's uh, suggestion and ask if anyone has Questions about uh, traditional lottery. Uh, we have a question from Delegate Buckle. Uh, Congratulations, by the way. <laughs> you have to unmute Delegate Buckle. Yeah, yeah, so that, that's what I wanted to ask. I'm, I'm very disappointed because up until about an hour ago, I thought maybe I was $730 million richer because I, I did <laughs> say a uh, Powerball ticket in Allegheny County. Many, many of my family members did. Um, we just found out that uh, I did not win, but uh, a person, I won't say who, but a person in a small town that is very good friends with my, my secretary. My secretary is actually a town council woman in Lona Coning, Maryland, which is where someone is now half a billionaire, uh, which is bizarre. And my, my question is, how does that work when we have a winner of that size for the state of Maryland? I mean, I assume that there's tax consequences that that, that might tax to them as, as income for them received in the state of Maryland. But are there any other types of bonuses, premiums, things paid either within the county where it was sold or the state? Yeah, absolutely. Um, the uh, the retailer uh, will make $100,000. Uh, well, that'll them. keep so, the Lona Coning grocery store in business for another six months. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Um, you know, the first choice, uh, and the winner has 182 days to come forward. So uh, I would hope they don't come forward in a day or two. I think they need to take their time, line up some really good advisors, uh, financial advisors, tax advisors, legal advice, that sort of thing. We, we encourage people to, to do that. Me too. Um, and then the, the main choice is whether to take the annuity or, or cash. Right. And, and by far, the vast majority of people do take uh, the cash. And the cash on the 730 is about 550. So on that 550, the uh, federal tax will be about 130 million and the state tax will be 48.8 roughly. Uh, so about 50 million in direct tax benefit to the state. Now there is a possibility of course that the player was from out of state uh, and uh, the out of state tax rate uh, I think is a little bit lower than the in state tax rate. So that number could vary on that. But Hopefully that's, it's a Maryland uh, resident. Yeah. And, uh, we'll I mean, that's possible. L L Lona Coning is a sort of isolated community. Um, uh, if you don't know where Frostburg is, it's about halfway between Frostburg going south to the West Virginia line. So it could be someone possibly from West Virginia, but it, it would be unlikely. You, you'd have to really be going out of your way to be driving through Lona Coning to buy a, uh, a lottery ticket. Well, you know, we, we had our uh, district manager uh, go out there immediately first thing this morning. But it took him about half an hour to, to shovel the snow and get his car out of the snowbank. So I know they got some snow out there and it's, uh, it's it makes travel a little bit tougher. Yeah. That's right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. And, and I'll make one other point. You know, I, I'm sure everyone uh, knows this. Maryland is one of the handful of states that allows winners to stay anonymous. So it may well be that we will never be able to announce uh, the actual winner. And uh, if that's the person's choice, however, if they choose to come forward, we of course will make a, a, a big celebratory event uh, press conference uh, to celebrate their good fortune. I'm just sad it wasn't me, but thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome and congratulations again. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Lutke. Madam Chair, just a follow-up question, Mr. Medenica. So you said the, the federal taxes and the, and the state taxes, and I assume this is income tax. Um, what about to the county? So Allegheny County has a 3% piggyback income tax. Um, do you have a sense yet of what the, the windfall would be to them? Uh, I think you could just take 3% of 550. So uh, that's what- 17 uh, million. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Nice. Take it. 
good news for them. Right. Absolutely. Yep. Delegate Ivy, or did you have a follow up, Delegate Lutke? All right, Delegate Ivy. Oh. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I got that dog fight, I said. Wonderful. Thanks for being back uh, here in front of the committee again. Just wanted to know if you could take us back to the third slide uh, and kind of go over where the profit's going and why. The 588.7. Uh, yes, sir. Kaylee, if you can go back to page three, please. It's pretty similar to last year and the year before as well. Yes, and uh, of course the uh, the distribution of those profits is determined by by you, uh, sure. and the bulk uh, on the traditional lottery side, the bulk of the money goes directly to the general fund. So it funds everything uh, that the state funds. However, there are some specific carve outs, um, and uh, uh, as you can see in the uh, the bottom left corner there. The uh, stadium authority uh, gets 20 million a year uh, and Baltimore city schools through the stadium authority also gets 20. Uh, I believe uh, the, the stadium authorities amount actually came down this year because of the bonds being paid off. And then there is a, uh, a slice that comes to uh, veterans organizations as a result of some changes in the law that didn't fully pick up every little piece and where it was going. Again, we, uh, we dedicate those amounts uh, and, and send them to them. One piece that isn't shown on this slide, but it is shown on our annual one pager, which I think you have all gotten, is also the, uh, uh, the funds for responsible gaming. And that is done via a, a direct fee on uh, the per slot machine and per table games. Uh, and that amount was about, I believe, 3.7 million this year. And it was down because the casinos are uh, uh, obviously closed. That's all on the casino side. That's not on the uh, traditional lottery side. Wonderful. Thank you very much. I just wanted to kind of point out that the vast majority of our these dollars are going to our general fund, which end up uh, going towards our public schools, but uh, not 100 percent. Correct. It's about. 90. That's right. That's right. Thank you so much, sir. Delegate Eversall. Thank you, Madam Chair. You, uh, you piqued a question for me, 3.7 million to the Problem Gambling Fund. Do you have any idea how much money is actually in that fund right now and how much is going out annually? Uh, you know, that is the, uh, uh, goes to the uh, Department of Health and uh, through the University of Maryland. And uh, I don't have that exact number. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna try to find. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. All right, any, any other questions on this lottery piece? And then we'll move on to part two of the casinos. Thank you, Mr. Radanica. Thank you. Uh, if we could go back to page 10 now. And again, I was uh, uh, confusing some lottery and casino numbers there, but uh, we'll, we'll pick up again and, and show those more specifically. Um, as everyone knows, we have uh, six casinos uh, geographically spread uh, throughout the state. Uh, and uh, they have all been doing extremely well. Let me go through a series of slides here and not to belabor the point because the exact numbers are uh, uh, well known to all of you, but let's, uh, next slide please. Uh, what we'd like to highlight on these slides in each individual casino is first of all, uh, to give you a, a sense of scale. And I think the main number that we're all interested in is obviously the contributions and that is to all of the beneficiaries of the casino program. So uh, MGM National Harbor, clearly our biggest uh, uh, casino, uh, fiscal year 20 contributions, uh, a little over 200 million. Also this year, we've added to the slides uh, what the year over year change was. I, I think uh, most of you are, are used to seeing uh, nice increases every year, but because the casinos were closed for over three months, um, what you're going to see is a pretty consistent pattern down about 25, even more percent uh, year over year. And that is uh, strictly a result of the uh, shutdown. So again, MGM, 200 million down 27, 28 percent. Next slide, please. Second largest casino is uh, live uh, in Anne Arundel County. Uh, again, fiscal year 20 contributions, 186 million, uh, pretty close to MGM actually, Live has been doing extremely well. And again, you can see there though, the year over year decline uh, approaching uh, a quarter of their business. 
Next slide, please. Third largest casino is uh, Horseshoe in, in Baltimore. Uh, pretty big gap between that and the, uh, the two really big ones at 65 million. And there, Horseshoe's problems were not just the, uh, the shutdown. And you can see that as uh, you know, declines of 35 and 34% in revenue and contributions. Uh, they have uh, uh, had issues with uh, uh, maintaining their, their player base uh, in light of uh, uh, other issues. Um, next slide, please. Ocean Downs. 25 million contributions, again, down that same roughly quarter uh, of their uh, revenue uh, because of the shutdown. Next slide. Uh, Hollywood Perryville, uh, our highest tax rate casino. Uh, contributions though, uh, because of that high tax rate, 30 million versus Ocean Downs, which even has a, a higher revenue number and a lower contribution number. And that's all just differential in the tax rates but also seeing the same kind of decline because of the shutdown as everyone else. And uh, finally, now in the newly wealthy uh, Western region of the state, Rocky Gap, uh, our smallest casino uh, at uh, 30 million in uh, uh, 15, sorry, uh, in uh, contributions, but also down that same 25%. So next slide, please. And this is probably, uh, you know, uh, unfortunately, I was sort of jumping ahead when I got the question uh, earlier, but this shows how the casino uh, uh, gaming is, uh, uh, revenue is, is distributed. There you'll see the bulk goes to the Education Trust Fund, but there are very significant uh, subsidies that go to local communities, uh, the horse racing industry itself, uh, responsible gaming, and again, a, uh, a small slice for our expenses, and, and that doesn't quite cover it. You'll see the little footnote at the bottom, our actual total expenses were around 17 million, but uh, we get about eight uh, of that back uh, directly from the casinos. Uh, and if, uh, if we can just uh, turn the page as well, if you just look at the pool of uh, beneficiaries, you can see there how the Education Trust Fund really dominates the uh, beneficiaries from the casinos. Uh, at over three quarters of the uh, revenue. But the, uh, the local aid has two components, uh, local impact grants and local jurisdiction funds. And the uh, horse racing uh, subsidy also has two components with the uh, purse dedication and the facility renewal accounts. And then again, that uh, responsible gaming slice uh, that uh, is, is calculated on a slightly different level than just percentages of, of revenue. And if we can turn the page again, um, again, it's always uh, a concern uh, because people think our funding for the Education Trust Fund is in jeopardy because the percentage has uh, declined uh, over the years. But as you can see, the actual dollars, and again, uh, with, with the exception of the, uh, uh, the pandemic uh, decline there uh, in the last year, have continued to grow. And if we can uh, go to the next slide, we'll talk about uh, the BRE estimates for the casinos. Now, uh, we were very pleasantly surprised uh, when the casinos reopened. They actually had some amazing months. Uh, one of the months actually was higher than year over year. And this is operating at 50% capacity. So we were frankly stunned at how well uh, the casinos have done. However, as the uh, pandemic has uh, gotten worse again, and uh, again, our three largest casinos are down to 25% capacity restrictions now. We've started to see softer results, but still I, I have to say, I think they're doing an excellent job. First of all, on all of the uh, health and safety protocols that uh, we and they and all the health professionals developed together. We spent that three months of shutdown really working on what they needed to do, how they needed to change their physical space, how they needed to uh, manage their players and uh, I think they've done a great job. Uh, and as you can see though, uh, the uh, uh, casino contributions to the state will be down again from, from our peak of a couple years ago. You know, interestingly last year with the, the shutdown, the lottery once again was making more money than the casinos. We, we have a little internal, uh, you know, friendly competition between the lottery side and the gaming side. 
And two years ago was the first year that uh, casinos produced more for the state than a lottery. That unfortunately flipped back the other way. Uh, this year, I think it's a bit of a toss up. Our, our year to date numbers are, are pretty close. Nevertheless, uh, I think all of you are aware the casinos continue to uh, uh, have uh, initiatives and investments. Uh, Live is already uh, building out their uh, event space to become a, uh, a, a sports uh, entertainment district. Um, National Harbor is uh, the last casino, but is also now in the planning process for an outdoor gaming space, which has proven to be uh, uh, attractive uh, for all of the other casinos. Uh, Horseshoe Casino, as you're aware, has a, uh, uh, a very ambitious plan for developing an entertainment district in conjunction with the, uh, the sports arenas uh, in, the, uh, in the area. And uh, uh, Ocean Downs as well has gotten some uh, zoning relief uh, and uh, is hoping to uh, be able to add uh, some uh, larger entertainment amenities uh, at their facility. So, uh, Again, I'll, I'll, I'll pause here and ask for questions on the casino side. Uh, Mr. Majenica, let me ask first question before I pass it off to uh, Delegate Hartman. Uh, during the uh, capacity uh, limits of 50%, the casinos were doing just as well. Uh, it, does that just simply suggest um, that they were never much more than 50% in the first place? Or did it also have to do with that three months of shutdown where you were, where you were able to help them figure out a way to bring people in? Uh, I think it, it, it was a number of factors. I think, uh, first of all, pent up demand, I think was very important. And I think after three months of shutdown, I think they enjoyed a, a real surge of players coming back to the facilities. Um, uh, however, now with uh, some of the restrictions on uh, the entertainment venues, you know, those continue to be shut down completely. And as you know, for example, Live had just finished construction of a very large event space. Uh, and uh, certainly the, uh, the theater at MGM uh, has continued to be closed. Uh, so I, I think there's, there's a, you know, a number of factors. Uh, also, uh, when they reopened, uh, they, they, a number of them did a slow reopening where it was really uh, by invitation to their uh, high level player club members. And so I think uh, they, to some extent, and I don't wanna overplay this, uh, they brought in their best players. Uh, and so you had a disproportional amount of uh, revenue uh, coming from their, their better players and uh, the capacity uh, constraints really uh, didn't hurt them in the same proportion as uh, you know, the 50% or the 25%. Clearly, they're making uh, much, much better results than that. And now we have continued restrictions on, brick, on uh, the restaurants. And again, the, the casino experience for all these places is very much a total entertainment experience with events, food and beverage, uh, et cetera, as well as the gaming, of course. Thank you. Uh, Delegate Hartman? Thank you, Madam Chair. So the question is with the um, initiatives as far as some of the casinos with the entertainment districts, does that um, profit, is that regulated in any way by the state? Does any of that go to the state or is it just the expectation of the enhanced um, gaming as a result of those additional um, amenities? That's exactly right. Um, we do not directly regulate uh, like the hotels or the restaurants. They come under the normal rules that any hotel and any restaurant would come under. Uh, we regulate uh, strictly the gaming uh, environment. But certainly, as as uh, you know, sophisticated business people, they understand that uh, you know the totality of the experience is important for uh, doing well on the gaming side because I think that is the primary profit driver, uh, rather than uh, the hotels and restaurants, which are often comped, as you're well aware, uh, for especially for their uh, high value players. Absolutely, thanks. Thank you very much, Delegate Hartman. Uh, Delegate Barnes. Uh, thank you, Madam. Uh... Chair, sure. um, I just had one question. I forgot the slide where it was on the FY20 total casino gaming, uh, where yes. you had uh, operating expenses for you all were 8.3 million, uh, but the total operating expense for uh, your gaming division was 17 million. How are you making up the difference? 
yeah, that comes, that's part of our budget allocation. Uh, that comes as, as but, part of our budget request for, as an agency. Was what, What's part of it, I'm sorry. Sorry. Is it part of the budget? Yes. What, what part, the eight million? Well, the, uh, the eight million is what we get from the casinos. Our total expense is 17. So the difference, which is, you know, roughly the same eight million uh, is a budget allocation from the state. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, thank you, Delegate Barnes. Delegate Smith? Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you for this presentation. I know that um, you know some of our neighboring states or even states that are a little further away are probably under some slightly different um, protocols as it pertains to um, you know, the, the coronavirus, but I wanted to know um, how would you um, compare and contrast our revenues kind of over the past, um, you know, fiscal year in light, you know, of these challenges? Are, are, are we kind of in, in the middle of the pack? Are we in the rear? Are we, you know, where are we as we compare ourselves to some of our, um, you know, similarly situated states? Yeah, and, and I think that's, uh, you're, you're exactly right. The, uh, we are, basically in a similar situation, but it would vary depending on uh, how restrictive uh, and, uh, you know, for example, Las Vegas opened up earlier, Atlantic City had different rules, Pennsylvania, different protocols, things like that. But I think in terms of the general decline, this is a national, uh, very much a national uh, phenomenon. And I don't think we're seeing uh, significant differences among states in terms of their revenue performance. One thing I would say is that we're probably doing a little bit better because the destination resort casino places have not been enjoying uh, all those people flying in. So I would say Las Vegas and Atlantic City probably in, in percentage terms are doing a little bit worse, whereas the, the more uh, localized, uh, uh, and, but frankly, you know, Pennsylvania is very much the same as, as that. Uh, same with, uh, you know, other uh, gaming states in the vicinity. So we're probably doing a little bit better than the, uh, the destination resort casinos. Uh, but again, the, the pattern is very similar across uh, the country. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, next, we have Delegate Patterson. Thank you, Madam Chair. And thank you for the report, Mr. Medina. I have a question. Uh, on one of the slides, you indicated that the Perryville Casino has pending a new ownership. Uh, can you share more information about that and whether or not there will be more initiatives or, or investments with that casino? Yes, I'm, uh, I, sh I should have mentioned that, thank you. Um, it, it really is not a significant event. Uh, you probably recall when uh, Perryville was first developed, uh, it was developed by a very large gaming company called Penn National uh, out of Pennsylvania. And a few years ago, Penn National took advantage of a, a very significant federal tax uh, in, incentive and placed the asset of the Perryville Casino into what's called a REIT, a Real Estate Investment Trust, R-E-I-T. Um, those uh, advantages uh, have uh, you know, lessened over the years. So what is happening now is basically that Penn National is reacquiring the, the assets of the Perryville Casino back into Penn National. And before there had to be a bit of an arm's length relationship once it was in the REIT between Penn National, the corporate uh, giant and uh, Hollywood uh, Casino. But now that they are back in the, uh, the Penn National family, if you will, uh, one of the immediate advantages is that they now have access to a, a very significant uh, sports betting uh, entity uh, as Penn National had bought Barstool Sports. So uh, the actual uh, uh, acquisition uh, is, is more about their corporate uh, tax planning and tax strategy and very little in terms of uh, operating results or anything like that at the property itself. Uh, any follow-up, Delegate Patterson? No? Uh, Delegate uh, Hornberger. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and just to follow up on the Perryville acquisition, which we are very excited about. The uh, as far as projections go, uh, do you are you guys prognosticating on income tied to sports gaming, 
or any or any numbers about uh, additional funds coming in. And then also the same thing goes for the acquisition in Perryville. Do you see any uptick in, in users and visitors with that acquisition? Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll take your questions in reverse order. Uh, no on, on the, uh, any uptick uh, from the acquisition related to the operation in Perryville. I think it'll, it'll be business as usual there. And uh, again, uh, not much of a change. As far as sports betting, we have not included any sports betting revenue in this fiscal year. And uh, in my last conversations with uh, DBM, I think that's where they are as well. Uh, given that the fiscal year ends in June, I think it's very unlikely that we'll see anything significant uh, in this fiscal year. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate, uh, Delegate Ivy. Thank you, Madam Chair, and hello again, sir. Um, if you could go back to slide 11, it's the first slide where it starts talking about uh, the revenue for the various casinos. I want to point out the, the big three as we refer to them some of the times. So, uh, that's for MGM? Yep. Yeah, that's MGM. It starts with MGM, then it goes live, and then it goes. Yep. Um, if I, I just wanted to talk to you about the hold harmless provision that's in place um, and ask you if you know um, you know, a, a, a rough figure um, of how much of this revenue uh, that would be going to MGM would instead be redirected to live and horseshoe due to this pandemic. Usually it's about four to six million a year, um, but I don't believe there's a cap. Uh, these are some very significant decreases uh, in revenue uh, at live and horseshoe. Yeah, I, we will have to get you those numbers. You know, I'm, I'm aware of, of how those calculations uh, are made. Uh, they're fairly complex, as, as you know. Sure. Um, yeah. But if, if we can get back to you on that, uh, that uh, you know, I just don't have that top of mind. Sorry. Or, or Madam Chair, maybe it's George Butler who would know. Um, but, but thank you, sir. We, we will get that. Absolutely. Uh, it's, it's, it's probably not our own analyst who will know. So when we get that information and any, any other follow-up, we'll share that with the committee. Uh, any other questions on the casinos before we move on to ancillary gaming? All right, next part, Mr. Medanica. Okay, um, as uh, again, all of you are well aware, we have some, uh, and what we call ancillary responsibilities and I'll flip through these uh, fairly quickly. Um, they don't have a, uh, I'm sorry, if we could get the next slide, uh, page 21. Um, first one, electronic instant bingo. Uh, this is something that was grandfathered as uh, part of the original uh, strategy for bringing casinos to Maryland. And uh, in uh, two counties, we have 13 uh, instant bingo halls. Uh, the, uh, we do not see the revenue from that. That goes through the comptroller's uh, department. Uh, but nevertheless, we regulate and, uh, uh, and uh, you know, maintain integrity for those programs. Uh, secondly, we have uh, a uh, instant, uh, sorry, next slide. Our instant ticket uh, lottery machine program in veterans organizations, uh, uh, basically on the, uh, the Western shore and the rest of the state, uh, again, produces a, a small amount of money, uh, but we are in 88 qualified veterans posts with about 376 machines. And again, we, uh, provide a uh, vendor uh, relationship uh, that gives that provides the machines, and uh, then we have a, a revenue split uh, as shown there. Third, next slide, please. Um, we also regulate the skills-based devices, and these are the amusements and uh, uh, claw machines and things like you see in the picture there. Uh, we regulate those, we require registration, we limit the pricing <clears throat> to make sure that these uh, remain as uh, family entertainment centers and uh, not uh, sort of slot machines in disguise. And uh, again, uh, since we started doing this uh, just a few years ago, we now have uh, about 3,800 devices at almost 500 locations uh, around the state. And then next slide, please. Uh, just a year ago, uh, a responsibility for fantasy sports uh, was moved over from the uh, Comptroller's Department to us, and we now uh, register those uh, fantasy sports companies, which uh, if you recall a couple of years ago when fantasy sports really went, uh, 
very big and there were tremendous advertising uh, that you couldn't uh, avoid. Um, it was our feeling, and, and I think we, we, we still believe that, that really fantasy sports at the time was really just a, a proxy for real sports betting. So I don't think the uh, activity on the fantasy side is really that significant anymore, especially in light of the ability of people to do real sports betting. So those are our uh, ancillary responsibilities. And uh, if I may just touch on finally, uh, obviously our commitment to responsible gaming. Next slide, please, uh, is very high. We have uh, so far achieved uh, World Lottery Association level three certification. Uh, the highest level is level four and that's what we're working on now. And we have a ro very robust uh, responsible gaming program. We work uh, very well uh, with the uh, Department of Health and uh, with the Center of Excellence. Um, in terms of the funding, we have one of the highest funding levels in the country for responsible gaming. And as you saw earlier, uh, again, it comes from direct assessments uh, against the number of slot machines and the uh, number of table games. Unfortunately, because of the shutdown in fiscal year 20, you see there that uh, we did dip from uh, over 5 million for the previous couple of years uh, to uh, under 4 million. So with uh, uh, what's happened, for example, as part of the health and safety protocols is that the, uh, we've, we've uh, asked that machines be spaced out and if not spaced out, have uh, plexiglass barriers uh, and also to uh, basically skip every other or every uh, you know, two every uh, machines in, in, to maintain social distancing in the casino. So, the machine counts are basically uh, significantly less uh, than they were and certainly less than their total authorized number. So part of the health and safety is not just a uh, capacity, uh, but also a machine spacing and frankly, taking machines out of service. We've also limited the, uh, the number of uh, uh, player stations at tables. So the number of tables hasn't gone down as significantly as the number of slots uh, but there are fewer players at each table. However, the assessment is based on the table. So there, uh, again, it uh, you know, has the potential for uh, staying up a little bit higher. But of course, uh, in terms of the, uh, the total number, the bulk of it comes from the slot machine side, regardless. And with that, I'll, I'll pause again before we get into the uh, other topics. Thank you so much. Uh, Delegate Ebersol. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you mentioned fantasy games, and now that you're uh, you're you're sort of dipping into that, do we have uh, two questions? Do we have any idea what the handle is among Maryland residents on fantasy sports, especially the daily fantasy sports or the instant fantasy sports, rather than the ones that are played among friends? And uh, I want to make sure I'm correct, but I'm, I'm going to make it a question: Do we realize any revenue on taxation from them? Uh Again, I'll take the questions in reverse order. No revenue. Uh, I think we have, I think it's 13 entities that are registered and licensed to do fantasy sports. Um, most of the uh, regulatory structure uh, we uh, took over from the comptroller and they are mainly consumer protection regulation. Not a lot of, uh, uh, we, we don't uh, get a lot of financial reports or have a sense of activity. Although our, our sense is that it's not significant but we don't have exact numbers. But nevertheless, uh, our main focus is on the consumer protection side. Just when you say not significant, what would be, <laughs> hate to use the term, what would be the over under on significance there for you? Oh, um, I, would, I would hazard a guess that it's uh, single digit millions. Okay, thank you. Um, but I, I would also like to follow up with you on that. If I'm okay, thanks, that'd be great. All right, thank you. Uh, any other questions on this section before we go into the additional info, which includes uh, information about sports betting as well? Yep. All right, thank you, Mr. Medenica. Uh, go on to the fourth part. Thank you, next, uh, next chart. And uh, go ahead and go to the next chart. Um, first of all, just to give you a sense of the, uh, the environment that we're operating in, um, we don't need to go through every one of these. Uh, it's a bit of an eye chart, I apologize for that. but. I think you're all aware that sports betting is very real in all of the uh, surrounding states. Um, and, uh, you know, so we will be somewhat late to the game, but uh, I think uh, we'll do fine. 
Uh, Virginia uh, is, is most recent and, and their launch will occur probably next month. Uh, and of course, you've got a mix in terms of uh, bricks and mortar location, um, mobile applications and that sort of thing. So we are surrounded uh, and uh, you know, we, we do have a sense, uh, certainly from some of the casinos that they are uh, at least anecdotally uh, seeing uh, some players going to other states to their casinos in, because they can also do sports betting there, particularly Delaware, I believe. If we can uh, go to the next slide. Um, we, we think this is a very important point to make. Um, you know, we understand that uh, I think everyone uh, agrees that mobile sports betting is going to be a very critical component to whatever structure uh, you, the legislature, come up with. But I think we, you know, we've seen in, in multiple states that the proportion of betting that is done by a mobile versus bricks and mortar is about 85% plus on mobile. So basically, sports betting is done on people's phones. Um, and so a lot of the uh, issues, arguments, uh, controversies about uh, land-based operations and online. Uh, I think, you know, online is a critical component. And this, you know, I think just reinforces um, uh, the, the balance between the two and, uh, you know, may guide your decisions that you need to make in terms of uh, uh, locations for, for sports betting. And uh, if we can flip to the next slide, somewhat a related point that uh, within the online sports betting providers, again, this is, uh, uh, we have imperfect information. I, I need to, to say that right off the bat. Um, but I think, uh, you know, this should be as no surprise to you that the two big guys, DraftKings and FanDuel, uh, obviously take more than two thirds of the business. And as you can see uh, from this pie chart, uh, then there's maybe a half dozen of smaller players uh, with uh, sort of single digit market shares. Uh, and then a, a, a slice of, of 13 other players, many of whom are very large companies, uh, but they're not very uh, significant uh, in terms of mobile sports betting. Obviously this will evolve. I mean, DraftKings and FanDuel, I think to some extent got a head start by marketing themselves via the, uh, the fantasy sports that they, they launched originally. And now, of course, they are whole hog into uh, uh, real sports betting. Uh, and again, you have a, a, a lot of consolidation going on in the business. Uh, I think you saw uh, Caesars uh, bought William Hill. Um, and again, I, I mentioned earlier that Penn National had bought Barstool. Uh, and every one of our casinos already has a sports betting partner. Uh, MGM, for example, has its own brand called BetMGM. Uh, and they will be marketing uh, themselves uh, with that brand. Um, Live uh, has a, 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 a relationship with, uh, I believe it's FanDuel. Uh, Timonium has a relationship with DraftKings. Uh, obviously, Hollywood has a relationship now through Penn National and Barstool. Uh, Churchill Downs, uh, which owns Ocean Downs, uh, has their relationship with Bet America and uh, Rocky Gap through their owner, El Dorado, has a relationship with William Hill. So the, uh, the gaming companies are already well on the way in establishing you know, who will be their, in a sense, back-end providers, and in, in many cases also their front-end brands uh, that they will be going into market with. So I think it's, it's uh, uh, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that uh, while there are many players, uh, the field is dominated by uh, just a very small handful. Um, if we can go to the, uh, the next slide. Now, this is a real flyer, and I, I'd like to, you know, give as many caveats as I can. This is as back of the envelope as it gets, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's instructive, and it gives us uh, an order of magnitude of what we're talking about. Uh, a lot of the confusion in the marketplace comes from people talking about the top-line numbers, what is often called handle, you know, the total number of bets that are placed. Um, and uh, obviously, the, uh, the legalization of sports betting, one of the major reasons for it 
was to bring that activity into taxed and regulated environments with high integrity and not just let uh, these offshore uh, sports betting providers dominate what is uh, you know, a, ser- a fairly significant market. So probably one of the highest uh, estimates we've seen that came from the American Gaming Association of the size of the illegal market in, uh, in the United States was 150 billion. Now, I can't vouch for that number in any way. It's, it's a huge number, obviously, and uh, uh, there's no real way of, of auditing it. However, if you just did, again, very back of the envelope, uh, you know, taking uh, Maryland's population as a percent of the nation, you could say that, or you could estimate that perhaps of that 150 billion, 2.7 billion is being bet in Maryland today through the illegal operators. Now, it's, it's important to note that sports betting is a uh, very uh, low margin business. Uh, it, uh, you know, you, you, companies win a lot, they lose a lot. Uh, and uh, what we see out there is estimates of uh, gross gaming revenue in the five to 8% range. So very thin margin. So if you take that uh, and attach it to that, perhaps 2.7 in illegal activity, uh, you see that there, there's potential for gross gaming revenue uh, in Maryland between 135 and 216 million. Now, if you take a potential tax rate on that, and I think the debate that we've heard is somewhere in that 10 to 20% range, you'll see that we get down to about 13.5 to 43 million. And interestingly, that is very much in the same order of magnitude as estimates we've seen uh, from other uh, entities in the state. Now, keep in mind that means uh, you know, basically converting all of the illegal activity into legal activity, which is not gonna happen. Uh, it also means that uh, you, know, you can have a, a fairly high success rate at 8%. And also you need to keep in mind the dynamic and almost the offset between tax rates and GGR, gross gaming revenue. And I, I don't mean to get pedantic here, but uh, to be competitive with the illegal guys, you have to offer a competitive product. And right off the bat, the illegal guys pay no tax. So they have an advantage and that advantage translates into them being able to offer better pricing. Pricing, you know, think of it as better odds or you know, just a slightly better. And so people who have existing relationships with illegal operators uh, and then see that, you know, okay, yeah, I could convert to one of these uh, you know, state licensed uh, operators, but, you know, they don't give me the, uh, the uh, odds that I can get from my illegal guy. So to the extent that we want to take market share from the illegal guys, argues for a lower tax rate so as to not disadvantage our operators in being able to offer competitive terms to the players. So, and, and of course we've, you know, uh, viewed the experience in many others. Pennsylvania, for example, is out there with a 36% tax rates and they've been roundly criticized. Um, you know, New Jersey has a very, very low tax rate. Um, you've got a state like Tennessee that did something unique in the industry where they have a minimum hold. Uh, so instead of uh, you know, saying that you know, normal is five to 8%, they've uh, declared a minimum hold of 10%. So we will see uh, how that does. Um, and again, the, the other dynamic going on here is depending on how competitive the environment is, even among the legal players, you'll probably, you know, more competition will probably drive down margins. So to some extent uh, in that five to 8%, uh, you might see, depending on the number of players and, and the, uh, uh, the intensity of competition uh, for, for players, uh, that you'd be at a lower margin. So all of these dynamics are occurring interactively and at the same time, and uh, so I, I don't uh, envy the position that you will be in in making decisions about how to structure sports betting. And, and then finally, next slide, just to uh, repeat some of these points. Um, the, the sports betting market uh, is, is highly competitive, low margin, and extremely volatile. And that's another point I wanna emphasize. Uh, you know, the, it's, it's not like the lottery. You, you can't sort of count on you know, a certain level of income that doesn't vary that much. Uh, you may recall that when Rhode Island launched sports betting, it was just before the last time the, uh, the, the Patriots went to the Super Bowl. 
and they ended up beating the spread. And I think Rhode Island was underwater for several months after that event because of all the, uh, the bets on the, uh, the Patriots. Um, another aspect of, of sports betting is that the, the backend computer systems have to be incredibly sophisticated. Uh, there you're dealing with, you know, literally millions, if not billions of dollars, uh, bets are being made, you know, very quickly. Uh, you know, this isn't people lining up at a bet window. They're all on their phone simultaneously. It has to have the ability to take, uh, you know, uh, thousands of bets, uh, in a second. Uh, and also marketing is a huge expense. Uh, player acquisition, uh, is a, a metric that they all look at. So it, it, it is not for, uh, uh, unsophisticated players. And it also demands a high level of integrity. Obviously, when we bring this into uh, the legal realm, we're going to be demanding uh, the same levels of uh, integrity, anti-money laundering, all the controls we have, uh, certainly in our gaming businesses now, will have to attach to the, uh, the sports betting uh, uh, entities as well. And also that final point, access to significant capital. And that is because of the volatility. Again, if a company can lose 50 million one week and make 50 million the next week, they need to have the financial capacity to absorb those kinds of swings. Overall, at the end of the year, they should be you know, making that small margin, five to 8%. But in the meantime, you're gonna see very dramatic swings uh, in uh, certainly week to week results, if not month to month as well. And so finally, and again, I'm being a little repetitious here, uh, remaining competitive with the illegal uh, market is important. And again, uh, low tax rate will help. Uh, that gives us competitive uh, pricing and it requires marketing investment by, uh, by the vendors and by the entities that we choose to conduct this activity on our behalf. So that's the, uh, the end of our presentation. I'll be happy to take some more questions. Madam Speaker, you're on mute. Thanks for the promotion. Uh, Delegate Eversol. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, thank you, Ms. Madeira, for this good presentation. If we go back to the back of the envelope uh, uh, calculations in slide number 30, I don't know if it's possible for the committee to do that or not. But it, uh, I'll remind everybody it had uh, a, a large figure for national uh, illegal sports betting is taking place. So that's a number where you say we can't expect to capture all that, but at the same time, there might be, uh, first of all, are we taking into account uh, new business? Lots, some people will not bet illegally because they don't trust betting illegally or because they don't like to do things that are illegal. Um, that would be <laughs> um, the, uh, the Also, I think that this number may be tamped down a bit because there's a lot more legal sports betting going on in, as you point out, other states uh, that would not be part of this national market, this national illegal market. Is all, are all those things sort of being rolled into this estimate or is it just... Uh, we're just going to kind of do a back of the envelope and say it's going to be around $20 million or so. I'm, I'm just curious if there's been any insight into the comparisons between the illegal and the legal market in terms of new business and uh, past, uh, the, the fact that it might not be as large as it once was, the illegal Yes, market. And, and, and that's exactly right. The, I think the $150 billion was the number that was being thrown around just at the point where the Supreme Court had made the decision to legalize sports betting. Oh, okay. So to the extent that now some of that uh, has been absorbed by states that have already launched sports betting, I'm sure that they're taking uh, uh, a share from the illegals. So um, this is sort of a, know, this sort of a pre-PASPA, getting rid of PASPA figure. At this yeah, point. yeah. And, okay. and, uh, and again, given how there's so little metric behind that number, I, I certainly wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't bet on it. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's all we've got at the moment. Um, but, uh, and, and certainly, uh, I think, uh, you know, one of the, the uh, things that we thought about, and, and I think it was a minor issue, maybe in a couple of press articles uh, during the lead up to the referendum here in Maryland was, you know, our responsible gaming uh, responsibilities. And, you know, do we expect this to be a, a huge, uh, you know, uh, uh, money absorber from customers, new money, if you will. And uh, our point all along is that our hope is that it would not be, that uh, really this is a, a market share conversion uh, emphasis. And uh, so we're not expecting, for example, uh, to see negative impacts on the lottery or on the casinos. 
uh, we don't think uh, you know that's where the share is going to come from. The share will come from hopefully the illegals. Again, all of this, given that there there is no insight into the illegal market, is somewhat speculative. But it also is based on people who have been you know dealing with these issues for some amount of time. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Delegate Ivy. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, Mr. Medenica. Hello again. Um, if you could take us back to page 28 and 29, um, I wanted us to focus on you know, where the actual business is going for online uh, versus land-based sports betting. Um, and so, you know, I remember last session we were having a discussion about, you know, the land-based piece primarily, uh, but really we're saying here that the online aspect is the most important figure was it 86 percent of all the revenue is going to come in um, online there yes parity study that was completed over the summer as well over the interim uh, which was important for us as we look forward to implementing uh, this I'm, I'm sorry delegate i you're you're cutting out a bit and i'm having trouble hearing your question sir can you hear me now that's better all right i, I was asking if you could just you know, confirm if it's important for us to ensure that minority businesses also have an opportunity to participate in online sports betting as well. Yes, I, I, I understand that that is an objective and, and you will be uh, including that in, you, in how you structure this. Absolutely. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you. Uh, next question, Delegate Smith. Thank you so much, um, Madam Chair. And again, Gordon, thank you for this um, presentation. Um, could you go to the very last slide, I believe? 31. Yep. Thank you. I apologize for not having the number. That's all right. <laughs> I wanted to um, just dig in a little bit here around like, you know, the, the framing you were giving, and which was very helpful for um, the sports betting market. Um, in terms of um, expertise and systems and everything in the second bullet, um, I think maybe it was 27 or 28 um, where you were with Delegate Ivy a moment ago, it appears that FanDuel and DraftKings constitute the biggest players. So my understanding is that um, in many instances, if someone has a license, they may ultimately have to utilize these types of businesses to make something happen. So I guess, could you kind of discuss the, 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 the types of expertise that's needed to actually like employ the functionality of sports betting and the difference between a license holder simply working with a company that has that expertise? Uh, yeah, and if I could ask that we go back to um, that slide, uh, page 29. Um, Again, a lot of these companies, because sports betting has been very common and accepted, uh, for example, in Europe, uh, frankly, around the world for years and years, a lot of these companies are international companies. And again, they have been doing this for a long time and they have uh, legacy uh, computer systems and uh, marketing experts and, and people who have done this. So they're not uh, building any of this from scratch. They're really just applying it to the American market, which right now, of course, is being viewed as the growth market in sports betting. And that's why you're seeing all of these companies, uh, many from overseas, who are coming in. Um, I think uh, my feeling is that it, it would be very difficult for a, a total startup for someone to try to do everything. Uh, I think the way to do it, and again, there are um, companies that, uh, uh, for example, uh, create what are called white label. Uh, in other words, they, they will be your back end, uh, but your brand uh, and whatever you market with could be something completely different. Uh, I'll use the example in New Jersey. They, they uh, allowed three skins per casino, and I think there are 12 casinos, so there's up to 36 skins. A skin is basically the brand that you go to market with. So uh, a casino in, uh, in uh, Atlantic City could have a uh, FanDuel brand, a DraftKings brand, and their own brand, for example. Uh, and, uh, you know, depending on, and then, by the way, there are also companies that you don't see listed here who are strictly back-end companies. Um, I'm trying to think of the name, uh, uh, Bet365. There, there are other companies that 
you know, don't have a consumer presence. They, they're strictly focused on providing the services. Frankly, um, our, our two biggest uh, lottery vendor companies, Scientific Games and IGT, they both have extensive back-end sports betting uh, capabilities as well. So for example, uh, I think the, uh, uh, the Churchill Downs uh, Bet America uh, back-end is a Scientific Games back-end. If, if I got that wrong, I apologize. But as an example, uh, so uh, I think in structuring it in Maryland, uh, I think it, it'll be, um, uh, I think what we will see is people relying on these kinds of companies to provide those services. You know, I, I, I'm reluctant to call them subcontractors. I, I think they're, they're major, you know, operating uh, back-end vendors uh, who can bring that level of expertise to the party. Thank you so much. Mr. Medenica, would, do you suspect that they might also be able to back up, as you said, there will be some uh, really big weeks and some bad weeks and that they would be able to back up some of that, the, the money and the bad weeks? Uh, you know, that will depend on the contractual relationship. I'll, I'll use a casino as an example because I'm closest to it. You know, we don't necessarily know the contractual relationship between a casino and let's say a DraftKings or a FanDuel or someone like that. So where the volatility um, lives, uh, I think is a, is a point of, of their contractual negotiations. Um, I, I think you can uh, recall from a couple of years ago where uh, we, we passed legislation to help our casinos deal with their own volatility a little bit better. Of course. Um, and uh, so now, if I may, uh, there's been a, a suggestion that I read recently out of New York that suggested that they should uh, run the sports book themselves. Uh, I think that is a, uh, I'm trying to think of a, a, the right word here. I, I don't wanna say dangerous, um, but I think it would be difficult for a state to have to explain massive volatility in their sports book if they were running it on their own account. I think you do need to uh, have that at least one level away from you know the state's own uh, you know revenue and, and financials. Thank you. Uh, I think we have two more questions. Uh, Delegate Hornberger. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Just had a question about uh, tax revenue for for Maryland. If I and if I do the proximity based betting where I drive across state line, place a bet, come back to Maryland. If I win. Uh, significant amount of money in New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania, which I'm only five minutes away from. D does Maryland see any of that tax revenue currently? Uh, it, it depends on uh, how, how legal a taxpayer you are. Um, okay. you, depending on the size of your win, first of all, you would get a W-2 from, mm -hmm. from wherever you won. Uh, then you would probably have to consider that out-of-state income. And uh, uh, you know, so yes, you, you could probably... Uh, have to pay some some state tax on that, okay. um, but otherwise, if, for example, it's no different than uh, if you were to go out of state and buy a lottery ticket in Pennsylvania, and you won in Pennsylvania, you probably have to pay Pennsylvania tax and Maryland tax. Okay, and I don't Thank know you. what the differentials are on that. Mm -hmm. Delegate Wilkins. Thank you so much, Madam Chair, and thank you, Mr. Medenica, for your presentation. Um, on the the sports betting, I'm just trying to synthesize um, the presentation. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? It said I was muted, so I was making sure you could still hear me. Um, I wanted to just understand. So given what you just said about, you know, companies that have been doing this for a long time and there's partnerships that, that can take place like with a FanDuel or a DraftKings to sort of, um, you know, put up the infrastructure and, and the skins and all of that. Um, is it, would it be accurate to say that, a business that is not a casino that might not all that does not already um, have a license from us could be successful in 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 partnering and entering the industry in terms of sports betting by partnering with um, like a DraftKings or a FanDuel or something of that nature. Does that question make sense? Uh, yes, and and I would add one other wrinkle, and that is if it's an entity that has no gaming experience. Um, they still have to go through the whole licensing process. Keep in mind that, you know, we have a fairly rigorous licensing process for all of the principals and employees of uh, any of our gaming entities. 
Um, and uh, so, you know, that, that would be another step. Uh, and uh, depending on, you know, what is required and what the licensing standards and what the regs uh, turn out, uh, that could be difficult. Also, the other aspect uh, that we've seen in previous bills is the, uh, the upfront licensing fee. Uh, and in some cases, uh, states have charged, you know, higher upfront fees and lower taxes or vice versa. So a, an, an a high upfront fee uh, could also be considered a barrier to entry perhaps. So again, lots of different variables, um, but I wouldn't exclude, you know, any creative structuring. Uh, I don't think it, uh, they get excluded out of hand. Yeah, a quick follow-up. Um, since, we, since we don't have sports betting live yet, in terms of what the licensing process for the sports betting license and the fees, that hasn't been set up. So theoretically, we would be structuring it to make sure that barrier of entry for a minority business or other businesses that we might um, want to participate is there, correct? That's we right. Have to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Delegate. Uh, any other questions for Mr. Medanica or his team on any part of today's presentation? Uh, if, seeing none, Mr. Medanica, uh, thank you so much. Uh, you all always give us uh, an excellent uh, presentation and that, uh, that the slide deck uh, always very helpful to members. If you didn't see in the chat, that is both available on the General Assembly website as well as on your floor system. Uh, so you can always look at that later and especially for our two uh, new members, it really is a great resource, all, that entire uh, briefing document. So it's the, uh, it's the one we measure all of our other briefings against Mr. Medenica. So we thank you uh, for that. Uh, just a great level of uh, detail without being more information than we need. And so it's very helpful. So really appreciate that. Uh, to the members, uh, we're back at 1.30 for our hearing today. So uh, we'll see you then. Enjoy your lunch. And um, thank you again. And uh, we're adjourned. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, everyone.